Hi, and welcome to my tutorial on concurrency. This tutorial builds on a video I made earlier about threads. Since threads and the basics of multi-threaded programming have already been covered in that tutorial, for this presentation I'm assuming that you know how to write C++ code to invoke and execute program statements in different threads. In this video, I will be concentrating on the challenges involved in writing programs where two or more threads are running at the same time and share a common resource. We will begin with some simple solutions and then gradually explore more complex constructs. I'll be covering atomic operations, C++ standard library atomic variables, mutexes, various kinds of locks and condition variables. To finish off, we will look at a typical scenario which is commonly referred to as the producer-consumer pattern and it includes an example of a bounded buffer. First, let's clarify what we mean by concurrency. Simply put, it means things are happening at the same time. But when it comes to computers and program execution, we have to be more specific. The CPU can only execute one program instruction at a time. So if we want to run two or more programs or threads at the same time, we either need more CPUs or somehow pretend that those programs are alive and running together. This latter is achieved by switching between threads very quickly, as this diagram illustrates. This could lead to performance improvement when, say, while one thread is waiting for some resource, the processor switches to and executes instructions on another thread. In today's computers, there are several processors or cores on a single chip and they execute instructions in parallel, that is, simultaneously. That could manifest itself in shorter response times, which is a good thing. Don't get too excited though, because a program you write, even if it is multi-threaded, might not execute that way. Chances are that it will run on just one core, while other cores are busy executing various other tasks. At our level of programming, we can safely ignore these technicalities and pretend that the threads are running in parallel. Now let us turn our attention to shared resources. A resource can be a file handle or a network connection, but the most prominent resource in a program is undoubtedly memory. Whether we are talking about a complex data structure, such as a vector of large objects, or a simple integer variable, they all occupy memory. The word shared in this context means that some memory location is accessed by two or more threads. Such an access must be synchronized, otherwise nasty things can happen. It must be understood that even a seemingly very simple operation of assigning true or false to a boolean variable is in fact a multi-step process at the processor level. If two threads are trying to update that boolean variable, they must not get into each other's way. Such a change must be atomic. The word atom derives from the Greek word which means uncuttable or indivisible and was used by John Dalton in the early 1800s to describe the most basic building blocks of chemical elements. Now we know that even the atom can be broken up into smaller components, but in programming we refer to the original meaning of this term. In other words, an operation is said to be atomic if it can be treated as a single indivisible unit of execution. The C++ standard library provides an atomic class template. In order to use it, the atomic header file has to be included. Now let us see what difference it makes when two concurrently running threads are changing the value of the same integer variable. In this example, we are counting the total number of votes a candidate receives from two districts. The votes are coming in from the two districts on different threads, 
and are added to the total. 1001 votes are received from the Sunshine Coast and 2002 votes from Emerald City. So, the total number of votes should add up to 3003. Would you agree? But that's not what we get, because at a lower level, integer increment is not an atomic operation. This here is a fairly standard explanation of what may be happening, so you might have seen it before. Hopefully it is self-explanatory, so I won't spend time discussing it. Luckily, there is an easy fix. All I need to do in the code is to change the type of this variable to this. Atomic int is one of the named atomic types defined in the standard library. When I run the program now, I get the correct value. To achieve an atomic update of a variable, internally the system might employ a synchronization mechanism that involves a lock. I will be talking about locks later on, for now I just note that they are somewhat expensive computationally. We can query an atomic type to see if it is lock-free or not. Here I defined a simple struct with an integer array member and created an atomic type from it. As you can see, total num votes, which is an integer, is lock-free but my struct is not. To define a custom atomic type which is more complex than a struct with some built-in types is unlikely to work, so don't get too carried away when creating your own atomic types. Since synchronizing access to shared variables is time-consuming, try to structure your code in such a way that you only perform atomic operations where absolutely necessary. For instance, the above code can be rewritten this way. Now the votes are added up in a local variable, and after the sum is calculated, it is assigned to the atomic variable total num votes. So, total num votes is only updated once, instead of lots of times inside the loop. Every thread will have its own copy of sum, so there is no risk of one thread overwriting the value of sum by another thread. Atomic types have some useful methods. Fetch and add is one, and it differs from a simple assignment by the fact that it returns the old value of the argument. This can be useful in certain algorithms. Compare and exchange strong is another, and this one is a little tricky. I mean, it took some time to get my head around it. This function takes two arguments, an expected value and a so-called desired value. If the value of the atomic variable is the same as the expected value, then the value of the second argument is assigned to the atomic variable and true is returned. Otherwise, and this is the funny bit, the argument expected takes on the value of the atomic variable, and false is returned. In this little program, I use this atomic operation to store the number of votes received on the thread that started to run first. You see, when the first thread starts to execute the getVotes function, the value of subtotal is zero, and so is the value of the variable expected. Therefore, down here, subtotal is assigned the value of the calculated sum, and it is printed on the console. When the second thread enters the getWords function, subtotal is already larger than zero, so the compare and exchange function returns false, and nothing is printed. Sometimes the Emerald City thread runs first, other times the Sunshine Coast thread does. This is a somewhat forced and not very sensible example. Compare and exchange, however, comes very handy when implementing log-free concurrent data structures. 
on the next few slides, I'm going to show what an in-queue operation looks like on a log-free queue. This takes us away from our core topic, so skip it if you like. In this scenario, element C has just been added to the queue, but tail has not been updated yet. Head always points to the last dequeued element. Now we want to attach a new element, element X, to the end of the queue. P and Q are pointers. Compare and exchange is called, and the syntax here is slightly different, but the logic is the same as I showed you earlier. The expected value is the second argument, and the desired value is the third. p.next is not null, and therefore the function returns false. Compare and exchange is executed again with different arguments. This time p and tail are equal, because they both point to the same element, b. Hence tail is assigned the value of p.next which is a pointer to element C. Tail now also points to C. Since success was false, the loop is executed again where pointer P is first changed to point to the same element as tail points to. During the next call to compare and exchange, P.next is updated to point to whatever Q points to, namely the new element X. This function call returns true. So we exit the loop and to finish off, assign the value of q to tail. So now tail correctly points to the last element in the queue. All these updates were thread safe. So if two or more threads were accessing the queue at the same time, they wouldn't have made a mess of it. Atomic variables are great but what if you needed to control access by concurrently running threads to more complex shared data structures? Such a scenario calls for a more sophisticated synchronization mechanism, commonly referred to as mutual exclusion. What that entails is that when thread A wants to use a resource currently held by thread B, thread A must be blocked until thread B releases the resource. A number of blocking mechanisms, or locks, are available, and we will discuss the most common ones, one by one. The simplest of them all is the spin lock. Here, the thread is just spinning around in a while loop until it gets the green light to go ahead and do its work. While spinning, the thread is active and uses the CPU. This is somewhat wasteful, yet this form of controlled access should not be entirely discounted as it benefits from not requiring expensive calls to the operating system and is free from the overhead of thread switching. I think it is okay to use it where we can be sure that blocking occurs for only brief moments of time. This here is an example of a number of fruit suppliers running on different threads and placing their fruit into a fruit basket. The fruit basket is the shared variable and is protected from concurrent access by a spin lock. In this case, spin lock is defined as an atomic flag and is initialized with a standard library built in initializer. Note that you cannot simply assign true or false to an atomic flag. It has to be done through an initializer. Down here, a number of threads are created and added to a vector of threads. Each thread executes the add to fruit basket function where fruits are placed into the single common fruit basket. The threads are competing for access to the fruit basket and the spin lock ensures that only one thread can use the fruit basket at any moment in time. A thread tests and retests the spin lock in a busy loop until it finds the lock unset. Then it sets the lock, adds a fruit to the basket, and having done its work, clears the lock.
Spin locks have a limited use, so let's move on to mutexes. The word mutex stands for mutual exclusion, and in C++ they are classes used to implement various alternative types of locking mechanisms and weight states. This example presents the most basic form of controlled access to a shared resource with a mutex. Two threads are running, the main thread and an other thread. They both output some text onto the console. Here the console is the shared resource. The main thread logs the mutex and prints some text. The other thread also tries to log the mutex, and if it finds the mutex already locked by the main thread, then it gets blocked. It does not do any work while it is blocked. However, as soon as the main thread unlocks the mutex, the other thread goes ahead, locks the mutex, prints its text, and then unlocks the mutex. The thing to note in relation with this simple form of locking is that the thread which has the mutex locked can block all other threads indefinitely. In other words, for the blocked threads there is no escape from their blocked state while the mutex is being occupied. This next example is similar to the previous one, except here a different form of locking is used. Try lock, as the name suggests, works like this. If the lock is free, then the thread locks it and executes the code in the true branch of the if statement. Otherwise, it immediately gives up and moves on to the else branch of the if statement. Yet another form of locking is when a timer is involved. Here, the other thread is waiting for the mutex to be released by the main thread before giving up. By the way, to be able to use this syntax for the duration, the chrono standard library header file has to be included. Also note that I have a using directive on the standard namespace at the top of main within which all these examples are written. I don't know if I made it clear earlier or if it is self-evident, but when all concurrently running threads are only reading the shared resource, then we don't need to worry about getting the wrong results. It is when at least one thread is writing to that is making changes to a file or some memory location that synchronized access is required. It would be counterproductive if reading threads had to wait for each other. Luckily, the C++ standard library provides a so-called shared mutex. The shared mutex offers the same set of locks as a normal mutex as well as another thread that is shared. In my next example, I have three threads, one of which writes to a data variable, and the other two just read the value of the same variable. The writer thread executes the writer function, where the data is changed, and the reader threads execute the reader function. I will be counting the number of times each thread successfully accesses the data variable whether to write to it or read from it. I am using a try lock, so some of the accesses might not be successful if the lock is already occupied by another thread. The number of times each thread will try to access the data variable is 10,000. So in an ideal case, that is if blocking never occurs, there should be 10,000 writer thread accesses and 20,000 reader thread accesses. Let me run this example first with a normal mutex, which has exclusive ownership of the lock. As you can see, both numbers fall short of the expected value. But pay special attention to the number of reads. 
Now, if I use a shared mutex and allow shared access to the data for the reader threads while keeping the log exclusive in the writer function, as you can see, we have many more successful reads than before. So this is clearly a performance improvement. Before we move on, you might ask why is the successful reads counter declared as an atomic variable? It is because here more than one thread can access it at the same time, so the increment must be atomic. Up here we don't have the same problem because the lock here is exclusive. You are not going to like me for saying this, but the way mutexes were used in the last four examples are examples of how not to write programs with mutex classes. One serious problem with that kind of coding is that if an exception is raised after a mutex is locked and before it is unlocked, then it will never get unlocked. In modern C++, there is a better way to implement mutual exclusion. The resource acquisition is initialization paradigm comes to the rescue. So let's look at some of the RAII lock classes. These classes manage the initialization and destruction of the locks for us automatically. The first one we are going to consider is the so-called lock guard, and we are going to revisit the example where votes for a candidate were counted. This time, instead of declaring an integer variable to hold the count of votes, I created a votes class with uh, some added functionality. We still have an integer variable for the votes count, but uh, there is also a function where the number of votes counted so far are displayed. Remember that the console where the output goes is also a shared resource, so access to it must be synchronized. And that's exactly what we are doing here with this log guard. The constructor of the log guard accepts a reference to a mutex for its argument. It then blocks until it is able to obtain a lock on the mutex. When it has the lock, the body of the function executes. And here comes the good news. When the log guard goes out of scope, here at the curly brace, the destructor of the log guard is called and in that destructor the lock is released. Should an exception be thrown inside the body of the function, the destructor of the log guard will still be executed, so we will never end up in a situation where the mutex is forever locked. The function where the m underscore votes variable is incremented is also protected by a log guard. Now you may ask, what is the point in creating a user-defined object for the votes count instead of just using an integer variable. The reason is that it is a good idea to put the shared variable and the code that protects it into one self-contained package. If I create a class that has both the data and the mechanism that guards access to it, then it is more likely that I won't make mistakes. It will be a robust system. Now let's create an instance of the votes class and use it to count votes on two concurrently running threads. Both threads are executing the getVotes function in which the votes member variable of the object is incremented through the overloaded plus plus operator. Also, at some random interval, the current votes count is displayed. What if we played with this class a little bit? and introduced another handy feature called call once. Call once in combination with the once flag is for making sure that a certain function is only executed once, no matter how many threads try to launch it. As it stands, the votes member variable is initialized to zero. But what if I don't initialize it here? Unsurprisingly, I get some crazy results. Pretending that instead of a simple integer, I have a more complex data structure to be protected, I might need a separate function to initialize my object. 
This is that function. Init voice counting should be called here, just before the first thread starts to increment the votes count variable. Importantly, the initialization should only occur once, otherwise the votes count would be reset every time this method executes. The solution is this. I need a flag that will be set when the init voice counting function is first launched. I also need a function that calls init voice counting and sets the once flag. The function parameters of call once are the once flag, the address of the method to execute, and the current instance of the object where that method lives. Now, when I run this program, you can see that the initialization method was executed only once. This is what happened. The very first call into call once succeeded, that is, the initialization method was executed and the once flag set. During this time, other threads calling call once were blocked. Subsequently, every call to call once failed because the flag was already set. There might be cases when you'd want to run multiple instances of the same class on different threads. How would that work? I created a class votes2, which is similar to the previous one, and here two instances of the same class are instantiated. The getVotes function of the class is executed on two different threads. <sighs> Actually, I'm going to skip this example, as it is not very interesting and we still have a lot to cover. So let's move on. There may be cases when in order to perform a particular task, a program has to acquire more than one resource. In a multi-threaded application, two or more threads might be competing for those resources. Imagine a real-life scenario where two painters want to use the same bucket of paint and the one and only paintbrush. One painter gets hold of the paint and then goes to fetch the brush. However, in the meantime, the other painter already grabbed the brush and now wants to obtain the paint. If neither of them is willing to relinquish what they've got, then the room will never get painted. This situation is called a deadlock and is simulated by this program code here. Each resource is protected by a mutex. Painter1 successfully logs the paint mutex and secures the paint bucket. In the meantime, Painter2 successfully logs the brush mutex and gets the brush. However, neither of them can log the other mutex. They get blocked there and nothing gets done. In this simple example, the deadlock problem could be solved if both painters try to acquire the resources in the same order. But in a more complex program, this may not be a practical solution. There is a better answer to this problem anyway. C++ has a lock function you can use to obtain locks on multiple mutex objects at once, without the risk of creating deadlocks. There are a number of ways the log function can be utilized. We've already met the log guard, and the way to use the log function with the log guard is this. The log function logs the two mutexes in an unspecified order, and importantly, in such a way that a deadlock cannot occur. By the way, any number of mutexes can be passed to the log function as arguments. If an exception is thrown for some reason, then the mutexes are automatically unlocked. The two log guards here adopt the two locked mutexes. After this, the program statements execute without interference from another thread. The log guard unlocks the mutexes when they go out of scope or if an exception occurs. An alternative is to use unique locks. The unique lock class is a more versatile lock. It has a number of constructors with different parameters. 
One of those is defer lock. It tells the unique lock to only store a reference to the mutex it receives, and the lock can be placed on the mutex later. For instance, when the lock function is executed here. Finally, we have the scoped lock. Scoped lock greatly simplifies acquiring multiple locks because it accepts a variable number of mutexes. One line of code does it all. And, of course, the locks are released when the scoped lock object goes out of scope. Now, I'm aware that this code could have been rewritten in such a way that only one mutex and one lock protects both resources. But here, the assumption was that each resource required its own protection. At any rate, these examples demonstrated how to use these locks. The unique lock deserves further discussion, although the lock guard will satisfy many use cases, there are instances when only a unique lock will suffice. For instance, condition variables require a unique lock, as we will see it a little later. A unique lock can also be passed into a function as an argument, or be returned from a function. Here is such an example. We are still working with two painters, a single paint bucket, and a brush. This time the lock for the paint resource is implemented with a unique lock on a timed mutex. The unique lock is created in a function and returned from that function. The constructor of the unique lock is given a duration of one second in this example. The constructor has this much time to obtain a lock on the paint mutex which is declared as a timed mutex up here. I prefixed the name with the letter G to indicate that it is a global variable also visible from the main function in the other file. When the getPaintLock function returns, we test if the unique lock has been able to place a lock on the mutex, and if so, then we can proceed to lock the other mutex for the paintbrush. If that also succeeds, then painting can commence. When I run this example, notice that Painter 2 takes longer to do his work than Painter 1. So when Painter 2 gets to use the paint and the brush first, then the timed mutex expires before Painter 1 can get hold of the paint bucket. Back in the code, the unique log being an RAII class, automatically releases its lock when it goes out of scope here. I put the old-fashioned and not recommended lock on the brush mutex. I had to intentionally unlock that mutex. The problem with this is that if an exception is thrown somewhere here, then the unlock statement never executes and this mutex remains locked forever. It would have been safer to use a lock guard here. Also, because of this if statement, if a thread obtains a lock on the paint, then it is certain to get the brush as well, so protecting the brush resource seems superfluous. However, in a larger system, another thread might be trying to get the brush without getting the paint, so protecting each resource separately does make sense. Now that we have seen a number of strategies for protecting shared resources from concurrent access, it is about time we ask the question, when and for how long to lock a resource? The short answer is, only lock a resource when absolutely necessary and for the minimum amount of time possible. For instance, consider this function where customer records are updated. A customer record is fetched from some source, it is processed, and the updated customer record is saved back where it came from. To ensure that only one thread can operate on the customer record at any one time, the execution of this function is protected with a lock. However, there are actually three distinct pieces of work being done here, one of which, and perhaps the longest, is thread safe. Once the customer record has been fetched and placed into a local variable, 
it can be updated without protection. So this code could be restructured like this. There are numerous ways a procedure can be written, but the bottom line is don't be lock happy. Try to avoid them if you can. We have briefly met once only execution before, and here is another example. We have an audio interface, and it has to be initialized before anything can be played through it. The audio interface is initialized in this lambda here, and it is called from the playtune function here. We have three concurrently running threads executing the playtune function. To make sure that the audio interface is initialized only once by the thread that first calls the playtune function, the call once class is used. The thread ID doesn't play a useful role here. You can change the code to prefix the tune with the thread ID. That would make more sense. Within the topic of once-only execution, I should mention that the initialization of static variables is always atomic in C++. Let me demonstrate it with an example. I defined a class called Spanish to English Dictionary. The dictionary is initialized in the constructor. Perhaps a dictionary file is loaded from disk at this point. Then we have a method that translates a Spanish word to English. And here are some sample words in a map member variable. I also created a function that returns a reference to a static Spanish to English dictionary object. The constructor is executed when the object is created and so the initialization takes place on this line. Here I have three threads running, one of those is the main thread, and they each declare a reference to the Spanish to English dictionary object. All three threads make a call to the getDictionary function, and we saw that in the getDictionary function the initialization routine is executed, so potentially the three threads could try to initialize the dictionary at the same time, making a mess of it. We will see if that is the case when I run the program. But first, on this line of code, a Spanish word is translated to English and some text is output to the console. To ensure that all this is thread safe, a log guard is used. We've seen already how a log guard works. Now I run the program. It works perfectly well. The dictionary is initialized by one of the threads only, and the other threads are prevented from interfering with it. However, if the Spanish to English dictionary wasn't declared static, then... To show what happens then, I need to make some changes to the code. I can no longer return a reference. That wouldn't work because the object I create here gets destroyed when it goes out of scope. So I'm returning a copy of the object instead. And here I'm declaring a local Spanish to English dictionary variable. When the variable D is created, its copy constructor is executed with the return value of the getDictionary function. Two unfortunate things happen. One is that each thread initializes the dictionary, even though it only needs to be initialized once. And the other is that the initialization itself, all these lines of code, are not thread safe. See now some of the lines don't follow each other in the correct sequence. Let's now move on to condition variables. Condition variables are useful when we want the thread that currently holds the lock on the shared resource to notify a waiting thread when the lock is unlocked, so that it can go ahead, lock the mutex, and do its work. In this simple example, I show you how to make use of a condition variable. Later on, we will revisit the condition variable in a more fully worked out example 
involving a bounded buffer. Here we have two threads doing some work together. In other words, they depend on each other to get some work done. One thread fills a bucket with water and then notifies the other thread that the bucket is full, it can be taken away. Then this other thread takes away the bucket of water, empties it somewhere and comes back with an empty bucket to be filled again. This could potentially go on for a while if it was placed in a loop, but for now I just do a one-off simulation. The condition variable bucket full condition is declared in the outside scope. This is actually a class with some methods as we will see. In both the takeaway bucket and fill bucket functions, a lock is placed on the mutex while the work is being done. The takeaway bucket thread is put on hold when the wait method of the condition variable is called. In this call, the lock on the mutex is actually unlocked, so that the other thread, the fill bucket thread, can grab it and do its work. The takeaway bucket thread just goes into a wait state, waits for a notification from the fill bucket thread. That notification gets sent by the fill bucket thread on this line. The notify1 method notifies one other thread. There is also a notify all method that notifies all waiting threads. When several other threads are waiting, it is undetermined which one of them gets the go ahead first. When the takeaway bucket thread wakes up, the condition variable locks the mutex again before the rest of the function executes. The program works as expected. Now, there is one little glitch, or potential glitch, which is caused by spurious wake-ups. When the takeaway bucket method goes to sleep here, and is not a very good sleeper, so to speak, it could just wake up before the notification is received. To prevent the unwanted continued execution of the waiting thread, there is another version of the condition variable's wait method, that takes a predicate as its second parameter. I'll add a boolean variable is bucket full, which is set to true after the bucket is filled. And this is my predicate in the wait method of the condition variable. Notice that it has to be a function. I cannot just put a boolean variable here. Yet another variation on the same theme is the notify all at thread exit function. I guess the name says it all. The condition variable has another method where the waiting time can be specified. Here we have an impatient takeaway bucket thread. It takes away the bucket even when it is not completely full. Finally, we arrived at the last topic of this tutorial. It's been exhausting, I know, but hopefully this next bit will be interesting and also useful. Some applications would have a worker thread produce some items that another thread consumes. Additionally, the producer and the consumer might not work at the same speed. That is, the production rate could be different to the rate of consumption. To balance out the mismatch to some degree, a buffer is used. Here is an implementation of such a buffer. It is bounded because its capacity is limited. The buffer itself is a standard library Q object. For flexibility, the type of the elements is generic. Elements can be added and removed from the buffer, but these actions must be synchronized. Each add and remove operation has to be atomic, thread safe. Let us look at a couple of methods in this class. The others are similar.
Try and wait to add to begins by placing a lock on the mutex to prevent concurrent access to the buffer by another thread. However, on the next line, the lock is removed by the condition variable and the thread is put to sleep. It is in a wait state until it is being notified by the reader thread or until the timeout expires, whichever comes first. Should the reader thread wake up by itself ahead of time, the predicate makes sure it cannot go ahead and try to add an element to the buffer if the buffer is already filled to its capacity. However, if all is well, then an element is added to the buffer. Lastly, the reading thread is notified via the condition variable has element. Observe that at this point the buffer must have at least one element in it because either an element was added to it or the buffer was full. At the other end, the reading thread or consumer is waiting for notification from the producer. The has element condition variable here works in a similar manner as the has space condition variable above. The predicate is of course different. It makes sure the thread does not try to remove an element from an empty buffer. All that remains is to test this code. This is just a simple, quick test. You can write others if you like. The reader thread tries to read all the elements in the buffer up to the buffer's capacity. Some of these attempts will fail if the producer is not quick enough. The writer thread tries hard to add elements to the buffer. I say tries hard because the add to method will block until it succeeds. As you can see, the reader thread kept failing until the writer thread caught up with it. Ok, so we've come to the end of this tutorial. I will put a download link to the source code of these examples in the description. Questions, comments are always welcome. Bye for now.